Four female newsreaders, including Martine Croxall, uh, who uh, famously was suspended once for laughing about uh, Boris Johnson's defenestration for his, from his fall for grace over Partygate on air. She said something like, am I allowed to be delighted? Am I allowed to be thrilled? Uh, no, Martine, you're not. You're an impartial BBC newsreader. Why didn't you know that? Anyway, uh, she's one of four newsreaders who are now suing the BBC for ageism and sexism. They're all aged range from about 48 to 55, something like that. And uh, they were part of the old school where there was a separate BBC news channel. Uh, that's been dissolved, so uh, lots of people, as often happens, were uh, told to apply for their old jobs, so suddenly you have to compete for your old job. So these four ladies were among them. And uh, they all lost out, and they say that the reason they lost out is A, they're female, and B, for the BBC, they're too old. The BBC, ageist? What a disgrace to suggest that. I must call for Ken Bruce about this. Uh, or maybe uh, Miriam O'Reilly, or uh, if he was still around, Steve Wright. All these really, really successful veteran broadcasters who uh, are told to sling their hook just because they're a bit too old, usually replaced by people who are far less successful. Uh, let's talk to uh, the head of campaigns at Popular Conservatism, Andrew Allison. Uh, welcome, Andrew. Good evening, Kevin. Good to see you back on your old slot again. Yeah, good to have you back on my old slot again. Uh, now, the BBC will be squirming about this. Of course, they deny that they're sexist and they're ageist. But if you look at the stories of Maxine uh, Croxall and her friends, her three f colleagues, all of whom were earning sort of £130,000 a year, something like that, it's hard not to conclude that they've got a serious case to say you victimised us, A, because we're female, and B, because we're not spring chickens. And these four uh, litigants have... Uh, 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 c calculated that they are earning or were earning £36,000, an average of £36,000 less than their male counterparts doing exactly the same job. Uh, so the BBC uh, loves its holier-than-thou saintly halo, uh, but it's not that great an organisation in this respect, is it? This is part of a wider problem, isn't it, Kevin? Uh, we've seen this with the BBC. You've mentioned some examples there of, uh, of Ken Bruce. I mean, Ken Bruce, I, I don't know how many years he did his show, I don't know how many decades he did his show on Radio 2, but he kept on increasing his audience year on year, and yet they, 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 they got rid of him. Uh, they, did, they treated uh, the late Steve Wright in a, in a particularly appalling way. So the ageist side of this uh, doesn't surprise me in the least because the BBC has got form. On the sexist side of this, well, I think that's a lot more difficult to prove, and of course this is going to court, and that's where it'll have to be decided. Uh, it, may, it could simply be um, that they thought the other people who were interviewed for the job were more talented, uh, had more to offer, uh, might be more flexible in their working. I, I, I don't know, but but certainly the ageist side of it, yes, I think this, the BBC does seem to have a problem with it. Uh, indeed, uh, and the BBC generally seems to be all at sea at the moment. When you see this kind of nonsense, uh, you know, th to think, you think about Gary Lineker, you think about all the problems the BBC seems to have on an almost daily basis. Uh, it does bring up that old question, why do we get charged 170 quid a year <laughs> just to watch this? Because uh, whatever's happening off screen, uh, the drama off screen seems to uh, outclass the drama on screen to say the least, and as for comedy, it doesn't exist anymore on the BBC. Uh, you know, it's not a very good service anymore, is it? It's certainly not the same as it was before, but I mean, when the licence fee first came out, and it was a radio licence in the 1920s, wasn't it? It sort of made sense, because the only radio that you could listen to uh, on the wireless, as it was known then, was the BBC. And it sort of made sense when BBC television came out, because the only television channel you could watch was was, was the BBC. But ITV came in in the 1950s, uh, and it should have been reviewed down. That was you know, nearly 70 years ago. And now we live in a world that is unrecognisable from those days. I mean, how many of us actually watch live TV now? Um, I don't watch live TV unless it's, uh, it's news, you know, current affairs, live sport. But that's pretty much it. I don't really watch 
anything else live. I, I watch streaming services. I watch things on catch-up. So, so the media landscape has changed completely. And yet the BBC is holding on to what I would describe as an analog funding system in a digital world. And this will have to be reviewed. We should have the freedom of choice. I mean, that's what it's about, isn't it? Essentially, a freedom of choice to decide whether we want to watch the BBC, and if so, whether we want to pay for the BBC. Um, and, and that's how it should be. Um, but I, I've, I've, I've campaigned on and off over the years against the licence fee, Kevin, um, and yet the politicians never seem to want to stand up to the BBC, because I think they're always frightened of getting bad coverage. What? Although the, although the coverage the Conservative Party gets now, I, I mean, I don't think really that makes any difference, does no, it? No, it doesn't. But Tories in particular and politicians in general, what they uh, delude themselves with is uh, they, they fear that the BBC is hugely popular uh, with the population of this country. Uh, well, I've got bad news for them. Uh, it certainly isn't among young people. If you talk to people in their 20s now or teenagers, they barely know what the BBC is mm. and they mm. certainly never watch it. Uh, now, let me uh, play you some uh, footage that you might find interesting. You'll probably remember it. One of the litigants, Martin uh, Croxall, uh, who is suing for age and sex discrimination, you may remember, got herself in a bit of trouble uh, when she made an announcement about Boris Johnson. Have a look at this. Well, this is all very exciting, isn't it? Hello and welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. Am I allowed to be this gleeful? Well, I am. And joining us is parliamentary journalist Tony Grew and chief political correspondent at The Telegraph, Camilla Turner. We could not have two better guests tonight. Uh, well, are you allowed to be that gleeful? No, Martine, you're not. You're supposed to be an impartial newsreader on the state broadcaster. What do you think that was all about? Well, she's simply revealing her true political colours there for, uh, for everyone to hear. Um, and you're right. I mean, if the BBC is going to continue to be funded by a compulsory licence fee, then they have to remain strictly as impartial as it is you know, possible to be, um, which puts is another reason why that the BBC should go to some form of subscription service in the future, isn't it? I think so. I mean, where, where do you... I mean, obviously, they are desperate to hang on to this licence fee uh, <coughs> because it gives them 3.5 billion quid a year. Uh, there's <coughs> another question for you. Can you explain to me, uh, Andrew, uh, and I'm not expecting a completely uh, decisive answer, uh, what, how an organisation admittedly a quite a large organisation, that is given £3.5 billion every year for free, i.e. our money, t TV licence fee payers' money, always complains of not having enough money. It always does, doesn't it? Yeah. It, it can pay Gary Lineker... Um, yeah, 1.3 million a year. Yeah. 1.3 million a year. He, he, he did take a pay cut, didn't he? Now, it may be that some people think that Gary Lineker is worth that. Uh, they may think, well, Gary Lineker's selling services maybe to Sky Sports and earn more money, and, and that may well be true. But they're certainly willing to pay him that amount. And yet a friend of mine left the BBC uh, locally uh, in, in Hull, for example, not far away from where I live. He was a veteran broadcaster, a really good broadcaster, actually, and a very fair interviewer, good journalist. And he's had to leave because of BBC cuts. So they're willing to cut all that local service, which you know, a lot of elderly people, for example, rely on. Uh, but they're not willing to cut the salaries of the of the of the top stars like Gary Lineker. Exactly. Uh, and do you remember that case uh, involving Jeremy Vine and uh, the female presenter, uh, whose name my producer will su supply me with in a little while? It was, it was a few years ago, and uh, she was uh, presenting points of view, and I think she's still at the Beeb. And she sued the Beeb because she discovered that the other guy... So she was getting 450 quid a show. And mm. uh, she then found out that uh, uh, Jeremy Vine, I think, was getting 4,000 quid a show. Uh, so, <laughs> so they've got something of a track record of paying men more than women for the same job. Well, yeah, I, but, but, but also, I mean, was she, was she a 
sort of recently new presenter, not particularly experienced, whereas uh, Jeremy Vine was a more experienced presenter. I mean, I mean that is perfectly possible. Yes, yeah, by think... the way, Andrew, her name was Samira Ahmed. Uh, and, yeah, uh, yes, I remember. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, she, yeah, she she said that he was getting, uh, I think it was, uh, how much was it? Uh, it's paid six... She, she was getting, or he was getting, six times more than she mm. was for exactly the same work. So uh, they've got form on this, the state broadcaster. Well, I think that, you know, that, that, that's very hard to justify, isn't it? Um, that, that sort of differential. Um, mm. But of course, I mean, these people are free to leave the BBC and are free to go to other broadcasters, aren't they? If they think that they can, they can get worse work elsewhere but of course so many of them stay with the bbc for for decades don't they they start with the bbc yeah. uh, right after university and they stay and they stay with the bbc until then they're they do. 60. yeah i mean john simpson has been there since uh, i think it's about 1902 i mean he, it feels like it yeah he's been there i mean he's been there forever uh but uh it, so we just saw Martin Croxall there uh, in an egregious example of unbiased uh, or very biased journalism upon the BBC. Uh, just a quick word from you on what you felt about the BBC's incredibly unbiased coverage of the Gaza conflict. They seem to be rather pro-Palestine, don't they? They can't even say that Hamas is a, is a terrorist organisation when it's a prescribed terrorist organisation. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I think when when it was said that Israel had bombed, I think it was a hospital. I'm going back now, back to November. I can't remember exactly uh, what it was, a hospital or a school. Yeah, it was a, it was a hospital. It was a hospital. It was a hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I, thought it, I thought it was. They were pretty gleeful. And, you know, the one thing that you could always rely on the BBC in the past is that it would take longer to break a story because it always checked its facts. Mm -hmm. But it didn't in this case. It jumped the gun completely. Um, so... Yeah, that because that was uh, that when the BBC decided that Israel had uh, launched a missile on a hospital, and it turned out it was a couple of bungling Hamas idiots who couldn't yes. fire the we weapon, weapon properly. They were trying to fire back at uh, Israel, uh, only their missile uh, plunged into the car park just by the hospital. Uh, and the BBC mm. said this was a, a dreadful attack and, you know, we were waiting for the casualty list. Didn't even hit the hospital. There was a small hole in the car park, so the BBC had to apologise for that. But that was a win into the BBC's pro-Palestine psyche. They really don't seem to like Israel at all. No, I, I, I agree with you. And, of course, all the figures of the people who've been killed in Gaza come from the Gazan Health Authority, which is run by Hamas. And yet it seems that media organisations around the world swallow everything that they say hook, line and sinker. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you know, I, I have a degree of scepticism about the figures coming from, uh, from Hamas. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody should. Uh, and can these figures be independently verified? And the chances are that they can't. But I'm absolutely sure that if, you know, if 10 people were killed in Gaza... Uh, this evening, Hamas will somehow have, have it up to about 500. Yeah, of course they will. Just before you go, Andrew, good to talk to you again. Uh, you've got this new job, uh, you're head of campaigns yep. at Popular Conservatism. Uh, we've been discussing on this show tonight uh, how, I mean, it sounds sort of cliche, but how this country seems to be going to hell in a handcart. Mm -hmm. We saw, mm -hmm. so today, uh, they were supposed to uh, coach drive uh, a set about 12 migrants or something from a hotel in southeast London in Peckham down to uh, Portland to the Bibby Stockholm barge. And uh, they couldn't get to embark on that journey because a load of demonstrators uh, lay across the road and wouldn't let the bus move. And the police basically stood there and looked at them. Uh, why can't we actually be a bit more uh, proactive in these situations and just get rid of these people? It's a, it's a mixture of things, um, actually, Kevin, uh, and what popular conservative, conservatism is about is taking back control. Yeah. It, was the slogan, it was the slogan that we used for vote leave. And, well, we've left the EU, but there's still so many institutions, so many quangos, senior civil servants, judges, you know, the European Court of Human Rights, they seem to want to stop us doing anything that we, that, that we should for ourselves. Uh, and decisions should be made in Parliament, and our MP should be scrutinising the government properly. Uh, but all, all of this just doesn't seem to go on, and it's as if the police in particular are terrified of upsetting 
any, certain any, groups of society. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, just just about anyone. But I mean, if you're if you're shouting a pro Hamas statement at a at a rally in London, then I can guarantee that you will not be challenged, or at least not very much. Uh, but also, if you seem to be a climate change protester, exactly the same thing happens. And it's happened here again in, in Peckham. I mean, what I would have done is arrested them all. This wasn't a demonstration. It wasn't a protest. What was happening was perfectly legal. It was the transportation of illegal migrants from one secure place to another. Well, allegedly secure yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But that, that's what it was for. And they had absolutely no right to interfere in, in the legal process. Yeah, I just don't understand why when there's trouble like this, the police, they don their uh, distinctive high-vis jackets and stand in a line looking at them. Uh, well, exactly. in, in other countries, they tend to deal with the situation. Our lot don't. Uh, listen, uh, Andrew, good to talk to you again. Come in next week and let's have a proper chat. Uh, put this well, country, th you. put this mad country to rights. Andrew Allison there, uh, head of campaigns at Popular Conservatism.